Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Monday, January 11th. It's also a great pleasure to be joined by Kelly Piala, who is the representative for the uh, State Legislative District that includes the towns of Windhall, Londonderry, Weston, Stratton, and Jamaica. Uh, and Representative uh, Payala, thank you very much for making the time uh, to uh, be with us and just share your thinking as the uh, legislature about, is about to get started, or, well, I guess you got started last week, actually, so you're already in session now. Um, but what do you see uh, looming as the major business that the legislature will be tackling as we get underway, at least in the outset? Uh, I'm assuming that uh, COVID-related issues uh, for the pandemic will be job number one. Would that be correct? Uh, uh, yes, that is definitely correct. And I'll um, say hello to everyone and then put my mask back on. Um, Apologies for that, but I'm I'm, to us I'm, at, hall I'm, at, I'm at work and so I'm wearing a mask. Um, yeah, so well, I mean, first off, on on Tuesday, the House is voting on um, the bill that that towns and municipalities uh, have been anxiously awaiting, which gives. Uh, all municipalities, which includes school districts and fire districts, not just towns, the ability to um, move the date of their town meeting, uh, to mail out their ballots to all of their voters if they so choose, as well as a, a bunch of other um, tweaks to the law to make all of that possible, and also hopefully to provide a bit of funding to help with uh, additional costs to Australian ballot voting for those who are you know, not accustomed to to making that shift. Um, so we're doing that on Tuesday, to my knowledge, and, and then hopefully the Senate will be able to um, pass it out of their body very quickly and uh, we can get it to the governor in enough times so that people are able to, to react um, before all the looming deadlines about town meeting um, are here. So that's, uh, so, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm also the town clerk, and so that issue is kind of top of my mind um, <laughs> on two fronts. <laughs> so most town meetings, I guess, are going to be, uh, what, a, a Zoom information meeting uh, instead of the traditional floor meeting, or, well, I shouldn't say traditional, because a traditional floor meeting would have uh, the information meeting and voting uh, on the articles on the warning. Uh, but uh, if, what, what seems to be happening is a lot of towns are going to have a, an information meeting online uh, on Zoom or some other uh, platform and then uh, follow that up uh, by uh, voting by Australian ballot on Tuesday, March 2nd. Uh, I think uh, every town has to figure out what works best for their town, uh, which is part of what this bill allows them to do. Uh, Yes, I think most towns are that that want to have town meeting voting happening in March are opting to use Australian ballot. Um, and this would also allow towns, but not mandate, but allow towns to, to mail all those ballots out if they wanted to. Um, some towns are talking about postponing the date of their meeting in hopes of being able to have an in-person floor meeting hopefully under safer circumstances later in the spring, uh, realizing of course that that still may not be an option and an Australian ballot may still be the, the safest option um, even as we get into you know better weather and hopefully more people being vaccinated. But you know it's, it's, it's a town by town decision and so I, I can't speak to what all towns are, are doing, but there are certainly a, an array of options, um, and hmm. have any of the towns in your district uh, landed on a format yet? Yes, uh, actually, uh, all all five of the towns that I represent have been um, traditional floor meeting towns, um, and I know some are looking and hoping to be able to postpone, um, in the hopes of there being an opportunity to safely meet, um, maybe in in an outdoor setting um, or in a different building, maybe then they're able to meet in, in, in normal times to allow for more space and, and more people. Um, you know, there's 
a lot of unknowns. And so we're all doing our best to, to plan under extremely stressful circumstances. But they still, they still have a couple of weeks to make decisions around that, I guess. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, uh, just turning back to uh, the legislature and COVID again, um, do you anticipate uh, the legislature trying to do anything specific to helping out, uh, let's say, various uh, business sectors uh, or uh, the economy in general uh, to help? Uh, uh, yes, of course. Things? Yes, of course. I, I, I don't know what monies will be um, spent uh, in that regard, as of yet, you know, the, the CRF funds are nearly all spent. And, and so, you know, we're then talking about state dollars unless the federal government um, does another round of, of financial supports to come to states um, for things. I know that one thing that uh, my committee, which is Human Services, will be looking at is uh, child care and how we can be supporting uh, access to childcare in order to allow our workforce to be going back to work um, as the pandemic continues and as you know, all school districts are 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 handling their in-person <laughs> student attendance differently. So I, I expect that will be uh, a, a major topic of conversation. Just to back up for a quick second, uh, the recently uh, enacted uh, federal legislation that uh, um, there was a bit of a hiccup on down in Washington uh, around Christmas time around the size <laughs> of uh, right. the, the checks, the $600 versus $2,000, uh, uh, came to a, about a $900 billion package. Uh, is there going to be any assistance for states? Uh, or some of the things, the services, or or assistance of businesses included in that that Vermont will be able to uh, tap into, or or will that not be similar to the original CARES Act uh, that was passed back last spring that uh, provided? Right. So a it's, 1, it's, 1. it's my under it's my understanding that that package does not include financial supports for states, um, but you know, there's we have a a new Congress. <laughs> that will be getting back to work and, and new leadership in Washington. And so we shall see. Any sense that, or from conversations with your, with your legislative colleagues that uh, in spite of the fact that COVID is uh, kind of job one, uh, that uh, Act 250 should also be given another look? I believe that that uh, is the case and that the Natural Resources Committee fully intends to take up Act 250 reform again, um, as does the governor's administration. So yes, I do think that that will be a topic of conversation. And you mentioned childcare a moment ago, and, I, and that's another topic I've heard uh, mentioned frequently. What, uh, what could the legislature do to kind of help childcare providers or people in, in who need childcare? What do, what are some of the proposals that are bubbling under the surface there that would uh, advance that? Uh, well, some of those conversations are have been ongoing for years um, in terms of what we can be doing to support our our childcare provider workforce um, and support families in being able to access childcare. And so, uh, one of those things would be to put more state dollars towards the child care subsidy program, which would um, increase the, hopefully, would increase the amount of child care subsidy that families would be eligible for, and so they would be able to be paying less out of pocket for their children to be in a child care um, setting. Uh, other things would, in my mind, include um, financial supports for people who work in the field for continuing education uh, and to push for wage parity for people who work in um, the private sector. You know, there's a, a lot of conversation when it comes to pre K around um, what people who work in for a school district uh, in teaching pre-K versus people who work in a 
a private program um, make in terms of their wages and access to benefits. And so working um, to allow the private sector to, to pay and provide benefits in a similar way as to what um, school districts are able to, I think, would go a long way to supporting the workforce, which then goes a long way to supporting our children and families. So we'll see uh, how that pans out. Yeah. If, if Congress does get around to passing a, what would be, I guess, a third uh, piece of uh, legislation uh, to help out uh, states like Vermont, um, it, would it be important uh, that that legislation uh, allow the flexibility for the state to apply some of the money towards its uh, its budget expenditures? And I guess I guess where I'm going with this is like, what 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 is the latest uh, figure you've seen on what the projected state budget deficit is? Uh, assuming I, I do I I can't I I. Do not know what that number is, so I'm not going to quote that number. To you. Okay, I guess ask because it seems like every year we start off with a discussion. You know, there's right. a, we, a back and forth about, oh my God, the state's got a fifty million dollar budget deficit, or it's a hundred million, or it's two hundred million, whatever. Right. And, well, uh, we, it always seems to wind up working out in the end. Uh, but I, I guess I just well, wondered if there was a an unusual situation around that this year compared to other years. So we should be getting the information on the budget adjustment which happens early on in the session every year um, to balance the budget. So we should be getting uh, that information in this coming week. Okay. So, Well, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> when we know that number, it always seems to be kind of like one of these things where, oh my God, that's a lot of money. And somehow another ways are found by the end of the session to, uh, to solve that. So hopefully that will be the case again this year. Uh, well, uh, Representative Piala, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you got a lot going on there up at the town hall uh, in Londonderry. I assume you'd be at right. Well, thank you. Yes. yes. Um, but so, I know that all the other town clerks are equally, you know, <laughs> you can, pouring their hearts out right now. <laughs> all right. Well, great. Well, thanks again for your time, and uh, we'll see you. Uh, I, I guess you'll be meeting remotely for the start of the session, but uh, maybe we'll be able to cross paths at town meeting or something. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. You're welcome, uh, Kelly. Thank you again for your time. The following day, we had the opportunity for a Zoom conversation with Representative David Durfee, who described what his priorities were for the coming legislative session. So, uh, yeah, uh, Representative Durfee, thank you again for making the time uh, to be with us today. Uh, and uh, really appreciate uh, you being here. So I guess, uh, uh, what do you see as the biggest issues facing the, uh, the state as, uh, or the legislature as we begin a new, a new session? Uh, well, the, uh, I, I think as you've spoken to other legislators, you've probably gotten a similar message that the, uh, the COVID, the impact of COVID, the economic impact. Uh, of course, there's there's the health impact too, which we can't uh, lose sight of. But the uh, the impact it's had on the economy uh, and on people's social structures, um, health, including mental health, uh, is is a you know a big factor as well. The um, the the some of the things that have been sort of highlighted, I think, as underlying underlying weaknesses that need to be addressed, underlying weaknesses in the, uh, the economic structure are the uh, availability of, of child care. And I, I, I know this is something that, uh, that Representative Paella has been working on and, and many others as well. So uh, if you don't have a place to, if, if you've got a, a a child that needs uh, to have somebody looking after him or her, um, and that means that you can't go to work, then that has a ripple effect. And this is this is not a new problem, and there, there have been shortages in the availability of, of, of spots in, in quality childcare programs uh, all along, not, not, a, not a new thing. But I think there's a there's now a sort of a renewed recognition. I, this is something that needs to be solved. So what what the solution is uh, uh, needs to be flushed out. But I think that one one thing to look at is we already have a um, 
a pre-K system in Vermont, three and, and four-year-olds are able to take advantage of up to 10 hours a week, uh, either in a, in a school or through a private provider. Uh, so there's a framework there for, for expanding that to something more reasonable. I mean, 10, 10 hours doesn't go very far. And if you're trying to work around that, good luck. So, uh, so th that, that seems like a starting point. Uh, it, it's also uh, not lost on many of us. I, I think that our schools, our public schools in, in many places uh, with dec declining populations, school age populations uh, may have some classroom space. And I, I think that there's been, a, there's been a, perhaps a reluctance or hesitancy for districts to take take on this, this responsibility, partly because there, there have been private providers so they don't want to put out a business. But right now we're in a situation where we just need to expand everything. So there's room for, for anyone who is in the childcare providing uh, sector to continue to, to do that work. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's still gonna be a challenge with finding people to do the work and uh, and that takes not just not just money, but um, you know, there's there's only so much of a supply. Um, but but I think again that probably the, the the school districts are in a probably in a better position, than the agency of education to help coordinate some of that. So this is not a bill that I'm putting together, but it's uh, a series of thoughts right. <laughs> that, that, that I presented. Um, personally, I am uh, moving to a new committee, and. That means trying to adjust my framework a little bit of thinking. Um, right up until last week, I imagined I was going to be back on the healthcare committee, and a lot of my thought there had been in dealing with the workforce challenges that also exist in healthcare, and particularly uh, in, in primary care. Uh, we've got an aging. Uh, supply of primary care providers in Vermont and right here in Bennington County that uh, are gonna be retiring soon, uh, relatively soon, and will need to be replaced. And, and we haven't had the younger uh, physicians and nurses and physician's assistants coming in to, um, to the state to, or staying in the state to, um, to take their place. So we worked on that a little bit last year. Um, working on some legislation that I hope to get in for uh, the deadline this, this week to, uh, to provide um, some relief for uh, physician's assistants who might wanna stay here in Vermont or come to Vermont, but are carrying heavy student loan debt. But in the meantime, uh, I, I'm now in the Ways and Means Committee. So that, that means trying to learn uh, all about uh, our, our revenues, and uh, I, I'm on the school board in at Mount Anthony, Mount Anthony District, so I've, I've got a pretty good handle on on uh, the education tax uh, and property taxes specifically. Uh, but but beyond that, I've, I've got a lot to learn. Um, there's been uh, for the past uh, I don't want to say maybe 18 months. I'm not quite sure the time frame, but a commission has been working on the taking a look at the entire tax structure of the state. And uh, it's got a report that ha has come out in draft form, 180 pages or something. So I've just been able to take a quick look at that. And, uh, and it, so I think that's gonna be part of our work. Um, there's, there's also a, um, a report that came out a year ago on se separately, entirely separately on the, the weighting factors that go into determining uh, local education tax rates. And there's a, a bill that's being introduced today, I believe that will um, uh, probably come before our committee uh, to, to make adjustments that would uh, benefit, benefit some districts uh, in Vermont um, financially uh, or provide at the same current tax rate, the ability to uh, to do more for for students. Um, so uh, 
that that's probably those two things are probably going to be uh, a lot of what the committee I'm on is going to be doing. Um, I haven't mentioned broadband. Uh, I should, and, and again, that's something that I, I suspect there is going to be broad broad support for. The um, the, the pandemic has has in a, in a couple of ways shed even more light on that. And, and again, this is not a new issue. I remember you and I talked about it a couple of years ago. Um, but but if you're trying to uh, learn remotely, if you're a fourth grader and you live um, somewhat off of 7A and don't have uh, cable and don't have reliable connection, then um, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to be going to school? And, and if you're trying to take advantage of the telehealth uh, opportunities that, that opened up this year um, and you don't have a good connection, you know, how, how, how can you do that? You know, again, the challenges are funding. It's, it's expensive, you know, extremely uh, costly to, to go uh, into areas that uh, commercial providers have, have not gone to because it's, it's not um, attractive financially for them. Um, and we, we also face the challenge that this is because it's a telecommunication um, industry, it falls really under the, under the federal government's purview um, more than ours. We can't, we can't regulate um, Comcast, for example, and tell them, you know, you've got to, you've got to provide service to this person um, who happens to live next door to somebody who already has a service. They won't, they, they won't do that just because we tell them to. So uh, anyway, so those are, those are a couple of quick thoughts. Um, that's very interesting. And, and uh, congratulations, by the way, on being named to the Ways and Means Committee. That's a very important and influential uh, committee. Uh, I guess I was just wondering, uh, how critical will it be for more federal dollars to come in uh, either uh, from a new round of federal funding uh, that might happen uh, when a new administration's in office in Washington, or will there be some money coming out of the package that Congress just passed uh, and was signed shortly after Christmas, the $900 billion package? Will there be revenues in there that the state can tap to help uh, balance the budget, or or is that uh, something that needs to wait for another another package? Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that the and it's a, it's a good question because the 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 first stimulus package, which had uh, uh, over a billion dollars that that flowed to Vermont, uh, did come with with certain strings attached, and and a big one was that the money could only be spent on uh, things that were pretty specifically tied to COVID recovery, couldn't be used to replace lost tax revenues, for example. And in, in Vermont, we've had. Uh, is particularly an, an issue with meals tax and, and rooms tax uh, revenues uh, with restaurants not being open and with you know the message being delivered pretty loudly and clearly that you can't just come and stay for a night in Vermont. You need to you know, be here for seven days and get a test, et cetera. So uh, obviously that's, that's had an impact on, on the on, on those businesses, a uh, uh, severe impact on the businesses, and then an impact on the on the taxes that they collect as well. So this new round, my, my understanding is that, uh, and, and I believe Vermont's supposed to get uh, 750 million. So not it's not as big a stimulus package uh, overall, but um, still a substantial amount of money. And my understanding is that it may not be quite as restricted as that first one. So that would be a uh, that, that would be helpful in uh, allowing the state to use it in, in ways that um, otherwise it might not be able to. The, the, other, uh, the other piece, little piece of good news is that the tax, uh, tax revenues, revenue collection through the first half of the year, and that's fiscal year, so July through December, is up fairly substantially uh, over the numbers that were forecasted back in August and, and were used to build the budget. So right now, anyway, we're um, 
and it, it doesn't mean that we'll hold on to that in the second half of, of this fiscal year. But right now, um, income tax collection is strong, uh, sales tax collection is strong, and, and that suggests that we won't be in a deficit at the end of this year, we'll have a surplus, and that there may be an opportunity to then you know, carry that over into next year because there is, I think there is still a deficit projected. We're in a recession. And uh, while v Vermont has been fortunate, uh, largely through federal, the, the federal dollars that we got through the, the first stimulus and, and other federal money that's come in, um, we, we've not, we, we've weathered it better than, than many places, but um, there's still obviously a lot of question about next year and, and the spring. One last question, sort of related to uh, part of that. Um, I, I guess uh, I, I've been wondering, uh, you know, the pension liability uh, fund issue has been one that's sort of been bubbling underneath the surface for a few years now and concerns raised occasionally about uh, my understanding is a, a three to $4 billion total deficit uh, in funding the uh, pensions of, uh, of uh, state employees. Um, is this a year you think that would be appropriate to uh, start chipping away at that, or is this the the or the issues around just kind of getting through the pandemic and, as you said, uh, helping businesses and the economy kind of recover back to where we were at uh, in December 2019? Uh, that's got to come first, and we'll we'll just have to worry about the pension liabilities in another year. Well, yeah, I think we are chipping away at it, and. It is. It is an. It is a problem. Uh, I mean, there's no way to sugarcoat it. The the liabilities um, are are there, and they they extend out into the next decade, into the 30s. Uh, the, there's there's a plan in the sense that there's been a dollar figure that's arrived at that would need to be appropriated each year in order to bring that. Uh, down into a more reasonable uh, range. The the uh, part, part of the challenge has been that coming there there are financial projections used to determine you know, what the what the pensions are going to be and also what the returns on our investments are and those returns just haven't been keeping up and it may be a difference of only half a percentage point you know six and a half versus a seven percent return in in the market but um, the at the scale we're talking about, you know, that's, that could be quite a lot of money. So uh, is this the year to, to step up and do more? Uh, eh, that would be, a, <laughs> that might be a tough sell. Uh, we're, I mean, again, we're, we're, we're looking at compared to, as I said, compared to the forecast that we were given in August, I think we're about $160 million ahead but bear in mind that that forecast was way down from what was budgeted 12 months ago. So when, when you know, initially the, this time of year, the governor, and, and it'll be coming up in a few weeks, I think, delivers his budget proposal uh, to the legislature. And that was, so that was before the pandemic uh, really had begun to surface in, in the country. And, and there wasn't any uh, it wasn't built baked in at all the budget. So, so the August forecast that now you know, we're beating was already low, low, you know, low barred uh, quite a bit. And, and I'm not sure exactly how much, but um, we, it, it might seem like, oh, we've got this big pot of money now to work with. Um, but I don't think we want to think of it that way. All right. Well, Representative Durfee, uh, thank you again for your time. I, boy, uh, there's sure are a lot of other things I think we could talk about. Uh, so we'll have to plan to uh, have a, a, another chat perhaps uh, later on after the session is, has gotten underway and uh, have you give us an update on how things are playing out. Well, great. Thank you for having me because I um, haven't being based in Shaftesbury, but representing Sunderland, a part of Sunderland, I don't always get to uh, get in front of the, the North Shire folks. So thanks, thanks for having me on. Well, my pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. And again, uh, good luck this session. Take care. Okay. Great.